Welcome to the official podcast of the University of Stuttgart, Made in Science. My name is Wolfgang Holtkamp. I'm Senior Advisor on International Affairs and your host. In today's episode, we welcome Professor Thomas Graf. After graduating from the University of Bern in Switzerland with a diploma and a master's degree in physics, he continued his academic career acquiring a PhD also in physics. During his time as a postdoc at the University of Bern, he went abroad to spend a year at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, Scotland. Back in Bern, he specialized in researching high power lasers and after a few more steps on the way, ended up at the University of Stuttgart back in 2004. Since then, he has been the director of the Institute of Laser Technologies. From 2013 until 2018, he was also vice rector for knowledge and technology transfer at our university. And throughout the years, he has had many memberships in different external laser technology societies. As we can see, Thomas Graf has a passion for laser technologies that goes beyond his scientific work. Plus, he enjoys sharing his discipline with the public. Therefore, we are excited to talk to him about lasers in our lives and what the future of laser technologies in production will look like, and also why he thinks spreading the word outside the university about what happens in science and is made in science is so important. Hello, Thomas. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. Thomas, when I think about Switzerland, I have a couple of images that come to my mind. I think, first of all, there is nature, lots of nature, and the best of it. Then tradition, a lot of tradition, reaching far back, and uh, tradition that is still very much observed in Switzerland as well. But what about innovation? I think there is also a lot of innovation in Switzerland, big exclamation mark here. When we think of innovation, we normally think about Silicon Valley in the USA, or perhaps Hong Kong, or Dubai. But Switzerland? Very much so, actually. Because Switzerland is one of the most inventive and innovative countries worldwide. This is shown by many studies and rankings, such as the current ranking of the Global Innovation Index of the World Intellectual Property Organization. According to this, Switzerland, Sweden, and the USA are the three leading countries. Germany ranks number nine. Against this background, Thomas, my question really is, how much Switzerland is in you? I think quite a bit. I really enjoy traditions. I, I like them. I, we, we keep them alive, also in my family that is living here in, in Germany. Uh, but I know Switzerland is perceived as a kind of uh, Disneyland for the tourism, uh, but there's much more to that. As you have mentioned, there's a strong scientific community, there's a strong uh, industry. Um, and I think that this, this tradition of yeah, keeping up these old traditions has also its benefits and its danger because it, it at least part of Switzerland becomes somewhat reluctant towards innovation and towards opening. And I believe that the decision of the Swiss government to stop the negotiation with the European Union will not be for the benefit of Switzerland on the whole. Um, so maybe that's the least Swiss part of myself that I'm living here in Stuttgart now and I've left the country. Um, but on the other hand, uh, as I said, with my family, we still keep up the, the Swiss tradition also at home. And uh, so that's, that's the Swiss part in my... In and Baden-Württemberg and Switzerland are very strong economic partners. I Not also. only that, also the culture is yeah. quite the same. So the basic Alemannic way of living is quite similar. And talking about your work, you have dealt with laser technology for more than 20 years now. How many lasers do you own personally? <laughs> to be honest, I don't know. Probably as most of the people don't know that they own um, a lot of lasers at home. 
how long is it now back that the vinyl discs have uh, been replaced by CD-ROMs. Um, that was probably the first time that everybody got lasers at home. Today you have lasers everywhere in the daily life. So I, I would have to count um, how many CD players and blue disc players we have at home to tell you how many lasers we have. We don't have a laser for materials processing at home. That's uh, too expensive and too dangerous <laughs> for the kids to play uh, with. But um, yeah, so I don't know how many I own personally. And when we turn from home to the Institute, what were your major developments in the last couple of years in laser technology, perhaps in general, but also perhaps a groundbreaking finding at the Institute here in Stuttgart? Yeah, that's a, a, a difficult question because there are many. <laughs> So I would say the most important development, and you just stressed, it's the Institute, it's not myself. Um, we are about 50 people uh, working at the Institute and many very skilled scientists. And I think the major development in the, in the past few years are twofold. On the one side, we have had a huge de uh, further development of, of uh, the performance of lasers. If you look at the past, this was always the bottleneck. The people that were applying the lasers for manufacturing um, were always complaining about uh, there's not enough power, the beam quality is not good enough, and the performance of the laser was in the focus, was the bottleneck, basically. This has changed dramatically in the last few years. So we have a lot of power available now. And at the same time, we have learned a lot about the fundamentals of materials processing. Many effects that were not understood 20 years back, we, we, we master them now, um, which makes a quite important change now in, in our community because the bottleneck has somewhat shifted. So the, the, the challenge is not anymore the understanding of material processing and the, the, the performance of the laser. It's rather that we don't have the machines that are performing enough to be able to implement our findings. So the, the bottleneck has somehow cha changed. And this is what uh, I find so fascinating at the moment. We have um, had the addition of, I would say in the back, we were very much focused on the laser physics, the physics of the laser, the physics of material processing. And now we, we learn more and more that we have also to master uh, system engineering. We need to develop new machines that are able to implement what we have learned about the laser materials processing. You already looked back a little bit, but you also gave us uh, the current, the view and the current situation. Um, how did it all start for you, Thomas? Uh, why did you decide to specialize in laser technology? That actually goes back to my studies. If I go even back before the time of university, I wanted to study chemistry. That was my idea because I thought, okay, chemistry can explain what keeps the world together, how, how, how things work. And uh, when, when I then entered uh, the university, I first thought to go to specialize into elementary particle physics because it's really fundamental things. Um, but you know, then you, you, yeah, you attend different lectures and uh, you find many other very interesting topics. And the first time I, got involved with laser technology was actually a practical. So during the, the physics uh, study, you had to make some advanced practicals. And uh, one of these practicals was to set up um, and characterize a laser very much the same way as uh, Theodor Maiman has done it for the first time. So we, we really made a, a, a chromium laser, a flash lamp on chromium laser. Um, and so this was very fascinating for me, that you just just a piece of crystal, you illuminate it with, with a flash lamp, you have two mirrors, it's as simple as that, and you generate a laser beam. And just uh, somehow I, I, I just, yeah, I, I was so fascinating that I, I kept working in this field also then. I, I was, when, I, yeah, when you look for a place to make your diploma thesis, um, I then joined the laser department at the institute there. And uh, yeah, so that's how I got involved. And I was ever so fascinated about laser technology that I, I stayed in this field to up to now. And at one point during your studies, however, you went abroad to spend some time, as we said, at 
uh, the university in Glasgow, Strathclyde University. And back in Bern, you also worked in an international team. So you had two comparisons based basically of international teams. Is there a difference or is there no difference? And working in such a team, can one can one really acquire intercultural competencies? Or is the focus on the lab work the dominant factor and uh, the and other factors don't play a role? It's certain that the work in the lab is the dominant factor. That's why you are doing science. <laughs> um, but this cannot be detached from, from the environment. And yes, of course, science, as from a certain level, is an international discipline. Um, I had in, in my team in Bern, I had more international members that I had in Strathclyde. There, everybody came from the UK. I, there was one Irish PhD candidate and the rest was from Scotland. Um, I don't think that to spend some time abroad is important from the pure technical professional development. It's, it's more a question of culture. It's a question of of widening your horizon, maybe further develop your character. Um, but it's used. I mean, in science, it's everybody is used to spend some time abroad. And I think that's a good thing. But this is not because your technical professional advance. This is because uh, of your more, it's more a cultural enrichment, I would say. And it's 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 OK that if you are trying to appoint somebody in an academic position that you do not just look at his technical skills, but also at his cultural and, and uh, character uh, skills, I would say. So I enjoy the time abroad very much. Um, but to be honest, the rate equations are the same in Glasgow as in Bern. So this was not for a professional advance that I went to Glasgow. It was just to to also learn to to yeah do science in a new environment to start up things from scratch again to work in a different lab which was even not as well as equipped at the, the as the labs that I had before so you you encounter f completely unexpected hurdles sometimes and you have to cope with them and that's important to learn to do that and when did you start realizing that the public needs to be involved and addressed in what happens in science. Why is that so important? I think this is a philosophical question and it's difficult to give a simple answer to that. Um, science has always been part of the society and has been the provider of advance, if you, if you want to say like that, both in, in, in humanities and in technical uh, sciences. So I think science is just an expression of the curiosity of, of people, of mankind. And this will always be part of the society. Nevertheless, especially in the, in the, in the frequent, on the, in, in the past years, in the most recent years, I, I, I believe that there has been kind of a, an alienation between science and society to some extent. And uh, for people, it's becoming more and more difficult to distinguish between real facts and just trumped up stories without any truth in it. And uh, this sometimes is worrying me quite a bit. And I think the pandemic has shown this quite drastically to some extent, that people just dismiss information that is coming from the experts, from the people that know uh, about the, the, the hard facts about science and about uh, how this uh, disease evolves. And um, the, the, the news or these <laughs> trumped up stories that are spread so efficiently by, by um, social media are then just consumed as, as a fact without critical thinking about it. And, and I think this is a danger also for our society. So I believe that the communication between science and, and, the, and, and the society is ever more important now that we have social media because the, the news spread over social media 
they are spread so efficiently and this is not usually the channel that we use for science and that's a danger because then the, the people just follow these stories be there ever so crazy <laughs> uh, and and they believe it and they it's all very often also more convenient to just believe this kind of facts rather than the the more complicated uh, stories uh, that are coming out of science, I would say. Does this mean for science that there needs to be a different approach how science is done? Or is this more of a matter of how science is and should be communicated? Uh, I'm asking this because yeah. at the center um, and at the Institute of Laser Technologies, um, the potential future laser applications um, are uh, tested and um, I understand that your institute puts an emphasis on a holistic approach. I don't think, to come back to the philosophical question, I don't think that we need to change how science works. Probably science has to learn to adapt its, its way of communication now that we have the social media channels that were not so popular before. But I also think that uh, it's not only a task of science. We, it's, it's not only the thought of science that we have this situation. It's my strong belief that we should pay more attention to the, to the basic education. We need a better general education of most of the population. We need to improve the education at schools. We, need, we, we somehow ended up now to educate consumers instead of educating responsible individuals that have a critical mindset, that look into the information they get, that have the ability and the skills to double check what they have learned through social media and to try and, and they, they know how to find out what is, what is real and what is just a trumped up story. And this is really something that is worrying me more and more. And I think the pandemic has really shown that, that we have a problem here. I see that in my own family, we have a lot of discussion on that. So I believe this will not be solved by changing science. We will have to change our basic, our, fundament, our, our education in the schools. It's there that we need to, to educate the people to, to develop this the skills to really res have a responsible way of, of dealing with information and, and to be responsible, to act res in a responsible manner. Um, and this cannot be solved by science. This must be solved by education, by the teachers. And the families on the personal level. And as you said, the discussions reach also in your family um, very deep. If we look at the country, Germany, um, what do you think is the biggest challenge in Germany when it comes to the acceptance or also the implementation of new technologies? Are we fast enough internationally to be really ready for what this decade and the next decades demand? I think in general, we are at a very good level here in Germany, but also in Europe on the whole. What troubles me sometimes is that I, I see the tendency that yeah, from politics and, and in general that people think that we need more people with academic degrees. I think that's the wrong way of doing things because the more you want to have, the more people you want to give an academic degree, the more you have to lower the level. <laughs> and th this, this is not a beneficial development. I think that we need good top science and it will always be difficult to, to reach a good scientific level. And so we should not dilute the quality of science just by having even more people uh, do, uh, making or reaching at academic degrees. We do not need a lot of science. We need good scientists. Um, and I think I, I see some tendencies also here in Germany to just ever lower, to make it easier to get into university and to get academic degrees. But I don't think that this is really what we should aim for. We should really aim for to have the best science here and not to have the most science. And what about the companies in this context? I sometimes uh, read also articles uh, where um, a rethinking 
uh, on the CEO level uh, is also demanded. Do you have any experiences uh, in that area? In my perception, at least from the view of, of laser technologies, I have perceived the, especially the, the German industry as very open uh, to innovation. And to be honest, that's also the reason why I'm here in Germany in the meantime. The German, not only the industry, also the governments, maybe just also because of the industry, has realized very early in the 80s what huge potential the laser technology has for, for manufacturing. And uh, so I was really delighted to see how interested the industry here, in, especially in Baden-Württemberg, was to learn what the scientific findings are in this field. So I had a much di more direct contact with industry here in Germany than I had in Switzerland before. And so I, I don't think that we have a, a, a problem here in, in Germany in this respect. I think the, the industry is very open to innovation, has a very strong contact with science. That's not the problem. That, that works rather well especially for laser technologies, that's definitely the case. Yeah. And against this background, what will the future bring? What do you think um, will be the next big developments in your area, in, in the laser industry and in laser research? I think if we look at the laser as a, as a tool for manufacturing, we have just scratched the surface. We have just opened the door a little bit and got a glimpse of the huge potential that is behind that and we are far from having tapped the full potential. We are teaching since 20 years or more, we are teaching the students that the laser is a very flexible tool. You can do everything. Uh, you, you can cover so many different manufacturing processes, be uh, primary forming, forming, separating, joining, coating, uh, changing material properties. There's no other tool that I know of that is so flexible as uh, the laser technology. But um, that said, when you look in, in, in practice today, if uh, somebody buys a laser machine for welding, they buy one type of machine. If they want to do laser drilling, they buy a different one. And this will change in future. As I mentioned earlier, we have had a, an enormous advance on, on the technology of laser devices, so our lasers are, have become much more powerful. And at the same time, the technology has developed in a manner that will allow, allows us today to set up one laser that can be operated in very different modes. Previously, you had to buy different lasers to do different things. Now you can set up one single laser that is able to perform all the just named processes. Um, and this, especially in the background of, uh, in the framework of, of uh, digital manufacturing, is an enormous asset. And uh, we can only imagine what potential this has. If you have just one laser machine that can perform all the, the known uh, laser materials processing processes, uh, this has an enormous potential. And uh, I look forward to, to see this to be implemented in industry. Do you also see any possible warnings, any dangers that may come along in, uh, because of laser technology, because of uh, research in that area? No, I don't think that this is any specific problem of laser technology. It's a pro uh, problem of any technical advance. I mean, ever since a piece of rock has been used to grind cereals for to prepare a meal, the same piece of rock would also hurt other people. So technology, technological advance has always bears the risk in itself that it can be misused for, for some evil applications. But I don't think that mankind is evil just per se. Uh, any, any new development, any tool that you develop can be used for, for a good purpose and for a bad purpose. And this will always stay like that. And that's not specific to laser technology. That's, um, as I said, a piece of rock <laughs> has always two sides and two applications, two possible applications. And that brings us nearly to the philosophical point again. Uh, things can be used either way as you just yeah. said. Um, and that is also often the case when you see science fiction. Mm. I guess um, for the science fiction fans listening here today, the question has to be asked, will there be lightsabers in the future? 
probably they are already the, the only difference to the to the movies that we have is that the light beam does not stop at some point <laughs> when you have launched it then it will go on forever uh, so the laser sword is infinitely long basically or at, at least as long as it hits a, an obstacle somewhere um, it's a powerful tool and a piece of knife can be used to cut an apple and it can be used to, to hurt somebody that's the same with the laser technology now let's come to the final part of our conversation. As some of you in the audience know already, this is moment seven. We have collected seven questions that we would like to ask you. Please answer them as shortly as possible. Moment number one. Spätzle or Maultaschen? Spätzle. Moment number two. One thing, one aspect, you could change about the world. To improve the general education of our young children. Moment number three. Do you have a museum recommendation for us today? My museum is the nature, actually. Moment number four. The best advice that you have ever received was? Maybe it was not the best advice, but a very funny one was of my predecessor to wear a tie during the lectures. Moment number five. What is your favorite place on campus? The Institute. Moment number six. Please complete this sentence. If I could start all over again, I would do the following differently. Actually, not much. I would definitely again go into natural science, probably again study physics and enjoy science. And moment number seven. Please complete the following sentence. The best thing about Stuttgart is... That it has a good university. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation. We are very much looking forward to staying in touch and wish you the best of luck with everything you and your colleagues do in a world made of science. Mm -hmm.